we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as you might have noticed, there is no Zoom chat in here. So please turn your attention to lecture chat and lecture questions within Slack. Uh, I'm really excited to get started. Um, hello, anybody who I haven't met. Uh, I know a lot of people are, are getting in right now. Uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot. If you haven't had a chance to see the kickoff or um, have any questions about the basics of Slack or the basics of the uh, class layout, uh, I can go ahead and get to those later. You can shoot me a DM. You can ask your TA. Um, all will be answered tonight, or most will be answered tonight, hopefully. Um, before Carrie gets started with her lecture, I did want to go ahead and introduce a couple of very important people. Um, hopefully, they're in the Zoom chat. Uh, Aaron and Pan, are you are you here? Hi, yeah, Alan. I'm here. I'm here too. Oh, hey. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and let y'all take it away. Aaron and Pan are the community engagement managers for Philadelphia and Kansas City, respectively. So take it away. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'll start off. Um, my name is Pan Learn, and I am here in Kansas City, and I hope to be your point person to um, help build our launch code community with this class. So what we, uh, Aaron and I had... Um, well, I guess I'll let her introduce herself and then we'll talk about the whole thing. So go ahead, Erin. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Davison. I use, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the community engagement uh, manager here in Philadelphia. Um, Pan and I just wanted to stop in and say hi to you all. Um, we are so excited about this class. Launch Code has never done a virtual multi-hub class before. I personally think it's the coolest thing we've ever done. Um, but don't tell Collins peers that. <laughs> I'm showing clear favoritism. Um, and Pan is just going to hop back in and tell you a bit more about how you can expect to engage with us throughout the duration of the class. Yeah, so is, um, we, this being our first all-hub class, it's for learning. So in Kansas City, we are going to hold um, several. Oh, hang on one now, second, Pan. Um, I think you're breaking up. You're breaking up right now, Pan. Yeah, maybe Aaron can take over since I'm breaking up. I can hop in. So because everybody is virtual and we're all located in different cities, um, Pan and I just wanted to make sure that the folks that weren't located where Launch Code's HQ in St. Louis is had opportunities to engage with each other and with Launch Code staff members who are local. So throughout the duration of the class, there will be opportunities to come together and study as a group, to eat lunch in a park or dinner as a group, um, to have, you know, have the TAs who are on the call right now do office hours in person if they elect to with a group of you at different times. Um, but just generally, Pan and I are also here that if you have questions that you're not sure where to direct, um, but it's specific to your location, for Philly, come to me. For Kansas City, go to Pan. You confuse us, that's fine. We'll bounce it to the other person. Um, and just if you have any questions on how to connect locally, um, meet up groups, exciting things happening in your city, please, please, please come to us. Um, we would love nothing more than um, to chat with you all, get to know you all, and support you through this journey. And as for the meetup schedule, Pan and I should be getting you that um, midweek or by the end of the week. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, Pan, I, I think your connection is a little bit better if there's anything you, you wanted to add. Yeah, I would only add, uh, can you guys hear me okay? That um, May 20th is our first scheduled in-person meet. And like Erin said, we'll be sending information out, but keep an eye out. We're doing, um, we do have a schedule for engagement um, here in Kansas City, and I'm going to stick with um, Tuesdays and Saturdays. These are days outside of your learning days so that we can support and engage your learning while you guys are going through the program. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, and both Pan and Aaron will be in touch. If you're from Kansas City or Philadelphia, definitely look out for their messages and uh, particularly watch out for the um, things they post in the respective cities channels. And uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Carrie. 
Thank you, Colin. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce myself in a second here, but let me get my screen back up. Okay. You should be seeing the launch code slide. Everybody good? Okay. I see a hand up. Courtney, did you have a question? Thank you. I figured it out. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So um, I, hold on just a second. I got to get, uh, I, I'm a, I'm not at home. I am visiting my parents and um, I'm in my stepmom's office. And so uh, I, things are set up a little bit differently than I'm used to. So I apologize for uh, the hiccups, but um, we'll get there. Okay. So um, let's uh, go ahead and jump in here. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, just how to succeed in this course. And then we're going to go through chapter four uh, on data and variables. And then I'm also going to actually introduce um, your graded assignment. As you can see on this agenda, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and yeah, before uh, before you um, go on to studio, Colin, are we actually doing a meet the TAs with this many people, or are we actually just going to let them meet in their yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we're going to go ahead and skip the meet the TAs. Um, the TAs are amazing. I love our TAs. We have a great group of people this time. Um, but it, it will take about an hour, an hour and a half at a lecture yeah. time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, definitely um, you'll have plenty of time during studio to get to know your TAs. Yeah, that's a holdover from the last time I caught this and situation was different. Okay, so um, then, yeah, then you will split off and go into studio and um, you will actually be switching the chapter four and chapter five studios tonight and do the chapter five one tonight and the chapter four one on Thursday. So this is just going to give you a chance to kind of talk about why you're here and um, you know, what your goals are and get to know everybody in your TA group. So it'll, it'll be good. Um, okay, so let me move here. Um, we have some graded assignment deadlines coming up. The first graded assignment is in three parts. I'm going to talk about it more, um, like I said, after lecture, but just I wanted to kind of have these dates out front. Um, the first part is due on the 22nd. The second part is due on June 1st. And the uh, final completed uh, uh, program is due on um, the 5th. And then, um, you know, that's a that's a drop deadline, which I know Colin has already explained, and I'll talk about it again a little later. Okay, so about me, uh, that's me when I was about four years old, sitting at a, a TRS-80 um, that my dad brought home from Radio Shack. So that's the very first time I sat down at a computer, guys, and I fell in love. Um, I My name is Caroline. You'll see that around probably if you're looking at some of my resources, but you can call me Carrie. Everybody does except for like my doctor. <laughs> um, my pronouns are he, her, hers. And uh, originally, uh, many, many years ago, I got a degree in um, structural engineering at WashU in St. Louis and uh, been about 17 years in the nonprofit sector. Um, I did uh, LC 101 um, and uh, liftoff and then the apprenticeship. And that LC 101 is just what this course used to be called, the web dev course um, that meets twice a week. And uh, it was a fabulous experience. I made the career switch. And uh, so then after that, I was a TA for the Women Plus program and for uh, their, uh, their liftoff for a couple of cohorts. And then it became a lead instructor. And so I've been doing this for about the last year and a half. Um, and I absolutely love it. I am really privileged to be here with you guys. Um, by day, I am a front-end engineer. Um, I have worked with the JavaScript, TypeScript, React, Svelte. Um, and I'm, you know, I love working on a UI. And that's that's user interface for those of you who are very, very new with this, um, where I get to kind of think about how people are using the website and wire it up in a way that makes it super functional and interesting and engaging. That's that's my jam. Some of you are going to not be interested in that at all. You're going to want to like work on databases and stuff. And that's totally cool, too. Just not my thing. <laughs> I have two cats, Marty and uh, Marta and Darcy. Um, and I love puzzles, word games, knitting, reading, drawing, painting, D and D, VR, uh, and I don't have gardening on there. I like that too. Uh, that's but that's me. Um, so I am very uh, excited to be here. And because I was a student, um, I you know really love to be able to kind of articulate to you guys how you can succeed. Um, just from this, the standpoint of having done it myself and uh, knowing you know what it takes. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to get the most out of launch code, um, some of the resources you have available to you, and uh, some of uh, our expectations of you, your expectations of me, like, you know, kind of what you can expect from me, um, and just some general advice and encouragement. 
Okay, so you got in. That alone is a major accomplishment. There are hundreds, and for, for a cohort this size, probably you know thousands of applicants that um, you know try to get into Launch Code, and uh, it's very very hard that you know we can only accept so many at a time. But you're here, and that's a major accomplishment already. Um, so you you know will want to just kind of keep in mind this course is very intense, but it's because we are cramming in so much information so that we can prepare you as best as possible to launch a career in tech. Um, so you just gotta kind of prepare yourself now mentally and otherwise to know that you're gonna have to work hard because this is not something you're just gonna kind of coast through. Um, having that kind of mindset up front is very important. So units one and two um, will give you technical training and then unit three, also known as liftoff, is where you get career prep and then you work together with a group of other students to build um, a working project um, that uh, has a, a user interface and it has a database and um, you know the whole thing. Uh, can, and, and I've seen such great student um, projects in the past. So um, it's always super fun I, you get, and you learn a lot. You, you continue learning through that process. So um, you can kind of see, you know, this kind of ramps up, right? And uh, that's just because it is, um, you know, intense and it kind of gets more intense. But then once you get to the end and you graduate, you can kind of take it at any pace you want to after that. <laughs> but right now it, it's going to be a, a pretty uh, intense pace. So um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the uh, tools and resources. And I know that uh, Colin has gone over um, a lot of this already with you guys, but I'll just kind of go through it quickly. Um, and so uh, the first one here is Canvas. Um, this is where you can kind of follow your syllabus, complete your quizzes and uh, log your class attendance, which you will get from your TAs in your TA groups in studio uh, um, during every class. And then um, you can turn in prep exercises, studios, and most importantly, the graded assignments, the ones that are actually graded. Um, and your uh, Replit is the place where you will actually write your code for now. Eventually, you'll be turning in code through GitHub um, later in this unit. And uh, then you would want to take your links to the code you wrote and turn that in on Canvas. Um, that's, that's where your TAs will actually get the links from. Um, you can also uh, slack them, um, but the graded assignments, especially, you want to make sure you turn them in on Canvas. Uh, you've got your course book that has the assigned reading, um, studio instructions, graded assignment instructions. Um, you'll want to get familiar with that, um, bookmark it in your browser, whatever you got to do to, to keep it um, right on hand uh, so that you can refer to it regularly. And then um, there's some helpful resources that are kind of uh, after the graded assignment links um, that are other, you know, little things as we, as the topics come up, you can kind of refer to those to get a little extra help. Um, in Slack, you will have the, the class announcements channel or things that um, mostly Colin and I will be posting there that we want to make sure that you know about. So make sure if you see that um, come across and, and light up, make sure you read what's there because you don't want to miss um, anything important. Um, lecture questions. So the lecture questions channel is where uh, you can ask questions at any time while I am teaching. And some of the TAs are going to be keeping an eye on that and, you know, weighing in and helping clarify concepts, because we have a lot to cover. Uh, during most lectures, we have, you know, a lot to cover in a short amount of time. And I can't always take all the questions live. And there's probably some of you who just don't want to speak up, you want to, you know, just type it in and ask it. So that's where you do it, lecture questions. Um, there's your group channels with your TAs. Um, you can direct message with people. And there's a phone app that you can use for Slack. And most importantly, there's a desktop app. Um, just I, the day that I figured out that I could install a desktop app and didn't have to manage Slack in a tab in a browser, I was a very, very happy person. Highly recommend it. Um, and Slack in general, um, actually, let me just pull this over. Um, you may have seen that in my, uh, I posted in the class announcements channel a link or a suggestion that you go over and find the Slack 101 channel. So let me pull this over here. Yeah, so you have the Slack 101 channel. I have some instructions here just to get, you know, figure out how to react to a post, you know, go into a thread um, and you can see the thread here and, and uh, keep everything kind of something that's related to a conversation. Threads are great because it keeps it all together and it keeps this part from being really, really long. And when we have this many people, um, it becomes that much more important to, you know, thread conversation so it all kind of stays together. So you can kind of practice that. Um, this one is uh, how to uh, format text in line, uh, which you can do with backticks. 
Um, and this one is how to uh, format like a whole block of code with multiple lines using triple backticks. Um, so there's you know lots of things you can look at here um, to practice and kind of get accustomed to Slack if you're not already used to it. Uh, and then some other resources. Um, I have a website where I have a ton of uh, practice exercises and guides and graded assignment prep uh, projects. Um, some of them already have to, like video tutorials and I'm adding uh, some of those all the time, but uh, I can pull this up and show it to you. Um, yeah, here. And you can like filter by like topic. So for instance, we're talking about data and variables tonight. So if I go to data and variables, you can see there's four um, extra tutorials here that you can do to get a little bit of extra practice and maybe approach it a little differently than the way that I taught it in lecture or whatever. So those are available to you. Um, just to give you a little extra help, I came up with most of them originally when I was a TA. Uh, and it just supplements um, the curriculum, all the topics that we talk about throughout unit one, it's just kind of kind of walk right through that. And then there's so much online, you can find so many things online and you're gonna figure out what your jam is. I mean, maybe you wanna go through like a step-by-step -step tutorial. Maybe you wanna watch YouTube videos. You know, Maybe you like reading documentation, um, to, you know, just kind of figure out what works for you. Okay, expectations. So while you're in class, stay engaged in lecture. Um, we go through a lot of things very fast, as I said, um, and use that Slack channel lecture questions. And if I do ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself really quick and, and answer. Um, but I, I will do that sometimes. I won't always do it. Um, just make sure you mute yourself back as soon as you're done answering, um, because we have a lot of people in here and the background noise can sometimes get really distracting. So just kind of try to manage that. Yeah, hey, there. that's my next bullet point, keeping yourself muted when others are speaking. And then uh, during studios, we highly encourage you to collaborate. Sometimes your TAs are going to put you in breakout rooms so that you can work together with a couple other students to solve uh, students to solve your studio problem that night. Um, and then sometimes maybe you'll all do it together as a, we call that mob programming um, instead of pair programming, where you're you know just all working together to solve something. Um, so you know, different studios kind of lend themselves, but these are these are important. Um, uh, things to practice because when you get into the real world, this is how we work. I mean, a lot of times we work, sometimes we work on together to you know figure things out. So we're gonna actually um, on Thursday have a uh, like a demo for you on what that looks like, you know, to pair program with someone else. But it's a very important skill to build. Okay, outside of class, make sure you're just checking on Slack regularly. Um, putting it on your phone really helps with that, but just so you don't miss announcements and also, uh, because other students are asking some of the same questions you are, and you can learn a lot from each other and help each other out. Um, expect to spend 15 to 20 hours per week on your prep work and your graded assignments. Um, this class, uh, as I'm sure Colin has mentioned, is a flipped classroom model where the lecture, like actually class time is a very small part of what you do. Most of what you do is outside class. And so you do have to put in the time. Um, complete your prep work ahead of, ahead of lecture as much as possible um, because you uh, the way we run lectures typically at Launch Code is we kind of expect that you already know a little tiny bit about it because you've done your prep work and then we can expand on that and solidify it for you. But if you come in and it's all just completely brand new, um, it might be harder for you to, to do that um, you know, in the moment. Uh, so I highly recommend it as in my experience, the students who do the prep work and stay caught up on that and come into each class prepared are the ones that are most likely to succeed. Um, don't do your studios ahead of the class. Um, that's because part of the gift that we give you of studio is to be able to learn how to solve problems together um, and have that experience. So it's better if you just kind of come in and uh, you know figure it out together. Um, you can turn in your work for TA feedback. I will say your TAs only have so many hours that they can help you. Um, it's, this is a very part-time position for them. So um, you, know, you can ask your TAs for help. Absolutely, that's what they're there for. But they may not have the bandwidth to be able to like hand grade every single one of your exercises. That being said, go to them and see if they're available. Go to TA office hours. You're gonna have a document with all of the TA's office hours and you, you, you can get help from TAs that are in other groups not just your own. Um, so, you know, definitely, um, you know, take advantage of that part of, this, of the important thing here is that LaunchCode is a community. Um, and then stay in communication with your TAs. Don't like 
try, it's easy when you, if you feel like you're getting behind or you're really struggling to kind of withdraw. <laughs> um, but we highly encourage you just to keep in communication, let them know that you're struggling or something came up and you got a little bit behind. Um, lean on them, get the support, make sure they know uh, how they can help you, how they can support you. Uh, this little uh, graph here um, just is representing that by the time you get to a graded assignment, you need to know, you're putting together information from several classes, from several chapters together. And so these prep exercises are generally very easy that you do ahead of class. And then you come in and you do the studies and you work it together to figure it out. Um, and all of that is preparing you for the much more difficult graded assignments that you have to do absolutely on your own with no, you know, no help from your peers. So um, just keep that in mind that if you start finding yourself, you know, thinking, oh, maybe I'll just skip the prep exercises and not finish the studios because they're not graded anyway. Um, just keep in mind that's going to impact your ability to really truly understand the material well enough to do these great assignments and, and on your own. So I highly recommend that you make every effort to, you know, do all of it um, to make sure you fully understand the concepts um, and can kind of build on that. And everything we're gonna be doing from today on is like building blocks. We're gonna lay a foundation with a lot of the basics and then you're gonna just keep you know, building and building new concepts and using it in different ways. And um, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna do some cool stuff together. Okay, so what you can expect from me. Um, I will always have a PDF of the slides that I use available for you uh, after lecture. And I also have some hidden slides, things that I'm not showing you right now. And that includes like screenshots of some of the live coded lecture examples, uh, links to the starter code and solution code so that you can go back if you want to uh, you know, watch the recording and code along and um, you know, practice with it a little bit more. Uh, I will go and check the lecture questions channel after, after I'm done and kind of respond to some things if the TAs um, uh, haven't uh, already. And uh, you will have the lecture and studio review recordings available by the end of class generally um, up on YouTube. And there are links for all of that. I'm gonna actually show you in Slack, which I lost my Slack, so here we go. Uh, okay, so if you go over to the um, class announcements channel, you can see um, right here, we've got uh, the main lecture Zoom link, you've got a class calendar, and then there's this little folder here that has all the stuff that I uh, will put up for you. This is a link to a folder on Google Drive that will have all the PDFs for all the lectures. Um, the lecture recordings are on this playlist. Studio reviews will be on this playlist. And I have graded assignment intros coming down the pike. The one for graded assignment one is actually already up on YouTube. So um, that just helps you kind of get the lay of the land. <laughs> and um, I kind of we will help you kind of, you know, plan ahead for uh, any tr things that students typically find tricky. And I did not mean to click on that. So let's, uh, nope. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, and then um, I was up here. The last thing is the link to that website I showed you where all of those practice exercises are. So, um, you know, keep it, keep in mind that you'll always kind of be able to come to this channel and find all those links right there. Um, and if you're looking for channels and you haven't figured out how to join them yet, you just come down here and um, to manage and uh, say browse channels and it'll show you these and then you can find, uh, for example, the Slack 101 channel and you can join it um, along with some of the other ones that are available to you. Okay, enough about that. Um, yeah, if you have questions about any studio reviews I did, do, and like I said, tonight, we're, there's not going to be a studio review tonight because you have a non-coding studio. You're just going to get to know each other and talk about your goals. But on Thursday, we will. And after you've watched that video um, that walks you through the studio assignment, um, if you still have questions, you can use that lecture questions, and I will pay attention to that and try to answer your questions. Um, and I always welcome your feedback um, about lectures and reviews. We, it, this launch code is a tricky thing because we have a limited amount of time to cover everything. Sometimes you might feel like I'm going a little bit fast. We have, sometimes we just have a lot of stuff to get through um, and I do my best, but that's why we have recordings available to you afterwards so you can go back and revisit some things. Um, but I absolutely welcome your uh, feedback and Colin, they're gonna have um, like a actual survey in um, a couple of weeks, right? Correct, yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know the exact date of the survey, but uh, somewhere yeah. Yeah. when we're well into, you know. Yeah, 
Um, <clears throat> so we'll you know, be able to definitely get uh, some more formal feedback from you guys, but um, I welcome it pretty much anytime. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that there's a lot of content and I'm not always gonna be able to answer questions live, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, and you know, when I'm setting up my lecture examples, I do my best to keep them relevant, sometimes make them fun um, <laughs> as much as possible. Um, throw in you know, some extra knowledge for you that may not have been in your book, but at the same try time, try to temper that so I'm not completely overwhelming you because this can be overwhelming already, right? So that's a balance that I try to keep. Um, I do my best. Um, and, but again, I welcome your feedback and then I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to screw up things on the slides or the, the, the starter code might have something in it. Just let me know. Um, so I can fix it for next time. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, so that's pretty much that. I feel like there was something else I was going to say about the, um, questions. Oh yeah. So, um, something that we ha are doing differently now with the format of the class is, um, the, uh, we're gonna actually stop like mid lecture and have a five minute break for one thing. And I also am gonna have, have actual formalized like places where I stop to take questions because with this many people, um, if everyone's just peppering in questions every single slide, we are never going to get through everything. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, try to hold your questions if you can um, until I actually stop to take questions because I think that's the only way this is gonna work. Um, Okay, so just some general advice and encouragement for me from my own exper uh, experience as a student, as a TA, and now as an instructor. Uh, figure out what works for you. Um, you know, find, figure out how you're going to set a time aside since you, the bulk of the, your work is actually done outside class. Um, make sure your home learning environment is as best as it can be for you being able to, you know, really just dig in and, um, you know, put, put the time in and not have too many distractions. I actually have a presentation about that on my YouTube channel and, and there's a link to it on, in that, on that website. Um, and then, you know, find those additional resources for learning if you want, you know, YouTube videos and blogs and practice problems and things. Um, but whatever works for you to kind of help you, uh, you know, get this knowledge really, you know, well sunk into your brain so that you can continue to use it. Uh, be kind to yourself. So this course is hard. Um, it's stressful sometimes because it is um, difficult, but kind of the attitude I started to have for myself and what, what seems to work for a lot of people is just to embrace the discomfort of that because it is what it is. Learning is uncomfortable. Learning curves are hard. Um, so if you kind of come to terms with that, you're going to be able to get through this a lot better. And everything you will be feeling is normal. <laughs> and everyone else is feeling it too. You are not alone. Um, so uh, that helps. And then just remember small changes, little tiny changes every day produce really big results. You guys probably don't believe me when I say that six from, months from now, you're gonna be able to build a full stack working application on the web, but you will because you know you may not even know how to declare a variable yet, you will tonight, but um, you're gonna be able to build up, build full applications and that's awesome in a small event. But it's it's just all these you know commitments to making these small changes um, all you know every week. And then just enjoy the process because we're gonna do some really fun stuff. All right, uh, next, um, having an extent, extended um, support system is really important. Um, because it is hard and you're gonna reach points sometimes when you're you know, a little bit stressed out and talk to your friends and your family, um, you know, let them know what's going on with you and how you're feeling and um, protect your relationships. And I say that because when we are stressed out, sometimes we're not very nice to the people that are closest to us. <laughs> and so um, I just encourage you to, uh, you know, be prepared to have conversations, honest conversations with your friends and family about, you know, what you need, what, what do they need from you? Because you are, everyone has a lot of things going on in your life and you are sacrificing some of your time and, um, you know, attention to be able to do this course. I mean, I was working two jobs when I took this course, which is, I look back and go, how did I do that? But I did it, you know, I figured it out, but it was hard, right? And so um, these are, you just want to make sure you have that support system in place and that you're, you know, um, having dialoguing about, you know, things to kind of help you get through it. Um, be there for each other. Launch Code is a wonderful community. I think it's the strongest thing about launch code is is the sense of community, the way that everyone works together and is there for each other. Um, so 
uh, embrace that, you know, jump into it. And um, you're not alone. Uh, you can help each other, build each other up and learn from each other. Um, that all of that is going to uh, be what makes you successful here. It's a very, very important aspect. So bottom line to decide today that you're gonna commit yourself to making the time and putting in the work and you are going to succeed. And that's um, pretty much, I think, all I have to say about that. Yeah, okay. So that's my pep talk, guys. But let's talk about uh, data and variables. So this is all about storing information. Uh, we're gonna talk about data types, printing to the console, detecting types and converting data, the variable, the constant, what, uh, what's in a name, about how to, how to name your variables, evaluating expressions and what an expression even is, um, different operators for expressions, and uh, the last thing will be how to get user input. Okay. So, um, with uh, data types, um, the, the first two we teach you are strings and, and numbers. So we're gonna talk about the string first and then we'll talk about numbers. Um, strings are made up of you know, words, letters, digits, special characters, um, and they have to be in either single or double quotes in JavaScript. Um, quotes within quotes uh, can totally be done as long as they're not the same kind. Um, and uh, a string can be very short, it can be very long. Um, a string can actually be empty, um, just be a pair of quotes with nothing between it, but it's still a string. Um, and then um, a number is a uh, positive or negative. Um, it, it can be an integer, a whole number. It can be a float, um, which is a floating point or a decimal number. Um, doubles are like longer decimals because back in the day, um, the way data was a st a stored, it was really important to, to like say if you have to actually store a lot of digits in a decimal number versus a uh, small ones. And it, it affects how the math is done. Um, in JavaScript, integers, floats, and doubles are not their own uh, data types, uh, unlike some other languages. They're just numbers. There's a single data type that covers all the bases. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and you don't use quotes, otherwise you've just created a string, okay? Um, and you also wanna make sure you don't use commas. Uh, you can have a really, really long number, but if you put a comma in it, J JavaScript doesn't know what to do with it. Um, so only, only decimals. Um, so you can kind of see some examples here on the right, but um, we can actually flip over here to, let me actually close this. Uh, so these are my examples. Can everybody read this okay? I get some thumbs yeah. up. Yep. Yeah. yeah, is it big enough? Okay, yeah, again, I'm using someone else's monitor and so I just wanna make sure the scale is okay. All right, so, um, we're going to talk about, um, uh, just look at some examples here of how to set up some of these veil. Uh, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about actually like creating the variables, but I just wanna give you examples of strings and numbers. So this empty string, we can leave this just like it is because it is empty. But if we wanna have a space, we can just have a space, that's a string. Um, you can have a single letter like a Z or Z. Um, you can have a farm boy named Wesley. You guys are gonna sense a theme in a second. And then you can also have uh, multiple words um, and uh, have, you know, Dread Pirate Roberts. <laughs> and then you can even have like, you know, quotes inside quotes. So here's an example where I want the string itself to actually have the double quotes in it. So I'm gonna use single quotes to enclose it for syntax for JavaScript's purposes. So I start with the single quotes for JavaScript and then I put my quote. Indigo said, hello. You guys know this one, right? My name is Nigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepared to die. And I would just like to point out that I came very prepared today and I am actually wearing my Inigo Montoya shirt <laughs> because it's a great movie. Um, and this is like one of the best quotes, so. Okay, uh, and then um, you can actually uh, see that the, the Rotten Tomato score, we can, you can have a number, but it's a quote if it has quote, I mean, it's a string if it has quotes around it. So I can say, you know, not, uh, the Rotten Tomato score for the Princess Bride is 97%. Um, we can represent that as a number. Um, I mean, as a string. 
Okay, uh, so numbers, um, I've got these all set to zero right now, but let's change these. So when um, we have a number of outlaws would be three. Um, when uh, Wesley is mostly dead, um, let's just say that that's like, you know, 0 0.985 or something. Oh, I forgot the decimal. Uh, it's like 98.5%, you know, dead. And then uh, after he is revived, let's just say, you know, his energy levels like, you know, negative 86 or something because he can like, you know, barely move, um, but he's alive. Okay. Uh, so those, those are just some different examples of numbers and strings and, you know, the right syntax for that. Okay, um, and <clears throat> we can talk about printing to the console. So first of all, what is the console, right? Um, it's a command line interface or CLI where you can execute commands. Uh, you can actually interact with it directly. And then you can also print to the console from your code using the syntax console.log. Um, and then you just place whatever you want to print uh, between the parentheses. And this is actually from chapter three. So if you did your prep work and read, you know, all four of the first chapters, um, it, this, and you can see this up here in the corner, it's chapter 3.4. Um, so for example, we can have this, you know, console log uh, JavaScript. And um, what would I expect then to see in the console? Anyone? JavaScript. JavaScript, yeah. Um, and then if I console log 365, same thing, right? I'm going to see, see that. Uh, right, right. Yeah, everybody check your mics. Okay. Um, right there in uh, the console. So let's uh, actually just take a look at this. Um, and by the way, I mentioned uh, that, you know, you can experiment here with using the console directly. So I can actually come over here and click into the console and just say, you know, uh, I have to actually do it right though. Hold on one plus two and it's three, right? Um, and it, pr it prints it there for us. So you can do that, but what you're pr mostly gonna be doing, unless you are doing user input, like that we'll talk about at the end of the lecture, uh, you're mostly gonna be printing using console log. So let's do a couple things like that. So we will uh, print a string and then print a number. I'm gonna console.log and then between the parentheses, I'm gonna say iocane powder. And um, I can run this with a big green button up here. And there it is, iocane powder. Um, so I can do it again. This time we'll do a number. Um, I'll just do like, you know, random, some big long chain of random numbers and um, run it again. And now we see 123.456789. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's how that's done, very simple. Um, you're going to be practicing this a lot. And by the way, um, I've gotten the muscle memory now to be able to type this pretty quickly. You're going to be sitting there frustrated going console dot log parentheses because you're not used to it yet. And that's okay. You'll get past that frustration the more you practice. Um, okay, so formatting. Um, I haven't talked about that yet. Let's go back over the slides for a second. Next slide. Okay, so. Um, oh yeah, I have this little thing over here. Sorry, forgot about that. But yeah, that's how that's said, console.log. That's how you say it out loud. Learning to talk about tech is a whole nother thing. Like you wanna get to the point where you're comfortable talking about everything. So I thought that would be helpful. Okay, so there are some special characters you can use that are helpful for formatting the way things appear in the console um, from your code. One of them, um, is uh, a new line and the other is a tab. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's more, but these are the two we wanna concentrate on. But it, these are escape characters. And it just means these are special characters um, that begin with a backslash and they have to be a part of a string. You can't just use them like as syntax outside a string. Uh, the new line character backslash in will add in a line break um, and the tab character backslash T will add in a few characters of blank space, which is great if you want to like end in things over. So we can demonstrate this um, by coming back to our code here. Okay, so we're going to um, take this code right here and I'm going to uncomment it. And you can do this quickly, by the way, by doing um, just, uh, command slash or control slash on a, on a PC. Um, and it'll just do it really quick and you don't have to manually type in the, the slashes up here. 
Um, so if I run this right now, I get this whole conversation between Fezzik and Inigo, right? That Vizzini, he can fuss. I think he liked to scream at us. Probably he means no harm. He's really very short on charm, but it's not very easy to read like this. So what if we wanted to kind of clean it up a little bit? Um, oh, by the way, you'll notice that I escaped um, that single quote right there. And that's because this entire thing for syntax purposes is in single quotes. And if you wanna be able to use a single quote as part of your text, you just have to escape it like that. So that's another way to do an escape character. Um, but let's, let's use these new lines and uh, tabs. I'm gonna put in a new line to kind of move this away from the numbers up here. And then um, before each of the uh, rhymes that they're you know, doing together, cooperative rhyming, um, I'm going to just put a backslash N and a backslash T. And so that each one should appear on a new line and they should be indented in a bit. So let's, um, I added all four of those. Oh, and then I will put um, one more here uh, so that there's gonna be a little space after this before the next thing we print as we go. There you go. So now you can see everything's nice and clean, really easy to read. But, um, that, you know, these are all tabbed in. So that's how you do that. And it's, it's super helpful. Okay. Back over here. Um, oh yeah, I have these examples on here um, that I didn't finish. So if I have A, B, and C, and I put the slash ends between them, they're gonna end up each on a new line. If I use the slash T's, they end up being separated from one another by a few characters. So um, that's, that's the general gist of that. Okay, let's talk about uh, how you detect a type to make sure that something is a string or a number or whatever. Um, and then we're gonna talk after this about how to convert types as well. Um, so for detecting types, uh, you wanna be able to um, use this keyword type of, uh, it's all, all one word. And that's the special syntax that will say, you know, I don't want the value of this, I just wanna know what type it is. And so if you combine this with console log, you can actually see the outcome of that, um, the result in the console. Uh, so again, type of is the keyword, and then the data is, you know, whatever you put after it. So type of space, and then the data that you want to find out the type of, that's all you have to do. So if I uh, say type of St. Louis, Missouri in quotes, what data type am I going to get in the console? A string. string. Yeah, a string. And if I say type of 20? Number. 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 Yeah, awesome. Okay. So you guys have, have, have got this. Good. Um, so. We'll uh, do an example of this in a second, um, but let's also talk about, oh yeah, so uh, semicolons. You may have noticed all the lines of code I'm writing have semicolons at the end. Here's the thing. Some of the compilers like Replit, for example, um, that uh, has the setup with, with Node, like it will actually allow you to get away with not using semicolons, but you should get in the habit of putting them always because your employers are gonna expect you to. So just get in the habit now, always put the semicolons at the end of all of your you know, executable lines of code. Um, it's a clean code thing. Okay, so if you wanna change the type of your variable, you can totally do that. Um, there are these functions, um, string and number uh, that will do that for you. So the function string changes something to a string type. Um, number changes it to a number type, it'll try to. Not everything can be converted to a number, right? Uh, and if it can't be converted to a number, it's actually gonna have this special value called NAN or not a number. Uh, so let's look at these examples. Um, if I take uh, the function string and I uh, pass in this number 3.14, what am I gonna see? 3.14 in quotations. Yeah, it'll be a string. And then uh, likewise, if I convert the string 3.14 to a number, I'm gonna get 3.14 as a number, right? Um, what if I try to give it pi? Not a number, that's right. Um, because I don't it, think it works, does it? It doesn't, that doesn't work. No. Um, so uh, that's, that's how that works. Um, so let's actually go and uh, do a couple quick examples of this. Uh, okay, so here 
we are going to uh, print the type of a string of characters to the console. So this is where we're going to use that type of keyword. And I'm just going to, oops, am I not? There we go. Console.log started typing, nothing happened. Type of R O U S. And um, we run that. And we actually see a string come out. Um, and when it provides you the type, uh, you can't tell from looking. Well, you kind of can tell because you'll notice that numbers, um, Replit actually provides it uh, in uh, a different color and strings are in white. So you can see that this response string telling you that um, ROUS is a string um, is also in and of itself a string. Um, if we do a number, um, we should see the same thing. So let's do type of, and then I'm going to say, you know, just negative one, I'll just choose a number. And we run it and we get back the string number. So um, this can be useful um, at different points. You're gonna, as you learn how to take all these basic things and write more complex code, we're gonna have examples down the pike of like exactly like why this is actually helpful. Um, but tonight we're just focusing on how to do it. Okay, so um, we can actually convert four to a string and print the result, and then we'll verify the type using type of. So um, print uh, the string four. And you'll notice that instead of putting, um, you know, uh, some sort of like hard coded value in here, I've actually just uh, gone ahead and added the function string and given it four, and we're just printing it all in one line. This is a very common approach. Um, and then I can follow up by saying, you know, give me the type of that exact uh, expression right there, string four. And so um, the first thing we see is four. Um, and it's as a string, not a number. We see that it's in white. And then we you know, verify that it's a string by um, checking you know, this entire thing right here. OK, so let's do it again. Only this time, we will convert um, a string to a number. Console.log, I'm going to say number 10,000. <laughs> OK. And uh, I'll verify it. Type of number 10,000. OK, we'll run that. And sure enough, we get the number 10,000. You can see that it's in a different color. Um, and it verifies that that is uh, a number after it's converted. Um, there again, um, we, there's going to be, especially I think even Thursday when we do some stuff with conditionals, um, we should uh, run into some practical applications for how to use this. Um, so let's try to convert um, Humperdinck to a number and see what happens. Okay, and then we'll check. Um, Type of, and then the same thing. All right, let's run it. Okay, so we get you know not a number, which is what we expected because it can, absolutely cannot convert this to a number. Um, but you'll notice that when we check the type of it, it says that it's a number, and that's just because not a number is technically a part of that um, class. So it's. Uh, it's a funny little thing, but it's not a number, but it, it still uh, would identify it as being part of, part of you know, that data type in a sense. Um, but you can't compute anything with it, right? Um, that will never work for you. Okay, cool. All right, let's talk about variables. Um, what is a variable? So a variable is something that stores data so that you can refer to it later. Um, gives you a way to keep track of information. And we declare this with the keyword let. Um, that's important. In order for you to establish something with JavaScript and say, hey, JavaScript, this is a variable, you want to use that keyword let. Um, the variable name should be meaningful. Um, we'll talk about that more in a, in a minute. Um, camel case is the naming convention. So that just means that if you have multiple words that you want to kind of cram together for the name of your variable, uh, you capitalize the first letter of all of the words except for the first one. And we call that camel case. So the value gets assigned with an equals operator. And, uh, and then the, um, this keyword var, you might see you know, var or var 
You'll see that in older code, uh, lots of examples that you're gonna run into online with JavaScript, um, but it's outmoded. Um, everyone uses let now. So uh, you're, you're always gonna wanna use let. Um, okay, so there's the keyword let, there's the variable name, my class, notice that it's in um, camel case. And there's that assignment operator and the value that you are storing um, in the variable my class. Okay, um, let's see. Let's talk about this idea of declaration versus initialization, because you're gonna hear these terms thrown around, declaring variables, initializing variables. I remember when I was just like, wait, what's the difference? You know, um, So I'm gonna talk about that. You declare a variable when you use the keyword let and, and give it a name. You just When you just say to JavaScript, I want a variable, here's its name. That's declaring. You initialize a variable when you assign the value to it. So um, it's kind of, it can be done in two parts. Um, and you, you, can, you can do that. You can declare without initializing and assign a, a, a value later. So we'll kind of look at this both ways. So in this um, little uh, sample over here, um, I've got, you know, let new language where I'm just declaring it. And then later along, I come along and say, I want new language to have the value JavaScript. And I'm doing it in two different ways. Um, there we go. Um, but you want to make sure, I want to point this out, you're only using that let keyword the very first time you establish it. And then after that, you can give it as many values if, as you want over and over again, but you don't use that let keyword again. Okay, that's only for declaring. Uh, but that's, there's the keyword, there's the variable name, and here's where we're using it again and actually, you know, saying I want to assign something to it, and there's the value I want to assign. So um, between the previous slide where you saw me do it all in one line and this slide where I've done it in two separate, um, you know, lines um, that gives you examples of both of those. Okay, and you can also reassign values. You can start out with, you know, giving it one value and say later, I want to give it a completely different one. Um, so again, you don't use that let keyword except for the very first time. So we already had new language. I established that on a previous slide, right? Um, and if I was to console log that, I would get JavaScript. That's what I originally stored. Um, what if I say I want new language to store Python? When I log it now, am I going to get JavaScript or am I going to get Python? Python. 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 Right, because I reassigned it. All I did was say, now I want you to store this value. And then I can do it again. I can say new language is uh, C sharp. And I console log new language and I get C sharp. Okay, so that's how that works. And there's going to be times um, when you're coding your programs that that's going to be advantageous to, you know, have a variable that has different vari uh, values at different points in your program. Okay, um, before we talk about constant, I want to come over and do a little bit of live coding again. So um, we are going to just declare and initialize a few variables here and print them so we can see the results um, in the console. So I'm gonna start with the let keyword and say Vizini phrase. And of course, everyone knows that the most famous Vizini phrase is in inconceivable. Yeah, inconceivable. Um, oops, I really should put the um, exclamation point in there. That's kind of important. Um, so I've stored it. That's great. JavaScript now knows that that var variable um, uh, holds that value, but we can prove it by console logging it. So I'm just going to do like this. And now we see inconceivable when I console log the variable name because that's the value that it's storing. So that's how that works. Let's do another one. Um, we're gonna do a number variable this time. So I'm gonna say let number of times spoken. And I'm gonna guess and just say, oh, he said it three times. I don't know, I'm guessing um, for now. And by the way, you notice how I start typing here and it suggests different possible things for me to do. Um, and so I can you know, choose the one and it, it helps it go a little faster. And if you are already on it, you can just like hit the tab key and it'll just tab right over and, and finish it for you. And you can kind of get into a good groove with that where it, it helps you type a little bit faster. All right, let's run it. And so we've established that number of times spoken equals three. So um, let's say we actually went and looked it up. We Googled it and, oh, he actually said it, you know, five times. So 
number of times spoken. I'm going to reassign it to five. Um, and then I will, oops, then I will console log it to check the value now that I have changed it. Oops, good heavens. There we go. <laughs> I'll run that. And now it has indeed been changed to five. Um, okay, so now we can do one more that we're going to uh, declare the variable, but we're going to print it before we initialize it. We're not going to initialize it just yet. So Inigo response. Let Inigo response, that's all I have to do to declare it. Um, and then if I check and see what, you know, what is the result of trying to evaluate this variable? Um, what do you think I'm going to get? I get undefined. So it, it's like, okay, you told me you wanted this variable, but you did not tell me what you wanted it to be. Um, so it's undefined. Um, so now we can actually define it and come in here and say, we want a Nego response to be, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna copy this. So give me a second. Here we go. Okay, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And that's his response. Um, and then once, now that if we go and we, and I'm gonna just copy this down. If we go and we console log it now, now it has a value. It is now defined to hold a value. Okay. So hopefully that helps um, you, you know, kind of understand how that um, this idea of storing um, data in, in a variable works. And then you can access it later and use, use it. Okay, uh, constant. I believe this is the last thing we're gonna talk about before we take a break. So uh, hang in, we're getting there. All right, so the constant also stores information just like a variable, but um, its value is protected and cannot be changed once you define it. So you declare it with a keyword const instead of let. And then um, sometimes you use the convention screaming snake case, where, which is basically just uh, all uppercase, you know, all caps with um, underscores in between each word. Um, but you will also see it just used in regular camel case too. Um, so you can see it either way. But this is very useful when you don't want to make sure something is never altered. You want to protect its value. So there's the keyword const. Um, I've used screaming snake case here for you, um, Euler's number. And uh, then I've got the assignment operator and the value. So the setup is you know, very similar to using um, let for a variable, but you use that keyword const instead. And it means you know, now if I go and I try to assign a different value to this, it is not going to work. Um, so let's look at an example of this. Uh, well, hang on just a second. Yep, yep, let's do an example. And I may have lied about the break. We may not quite be there yet. Um, okay. All right, so we're going to declare and initialize a uh, constant here. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna use this uh, screaming snake case, the all caps underscore naming convention uh, and say const mo movie title. There we go. And we'll call it the Princess Bride because that's clearly the theme of tonight's lecture examples. Um, and then we will try to assign a new value and kind of see, you know, what happens when we try to run it. Um, so I can say, you know, now I want to change movie title and make it some other title. Doesn't matter. It's not going to work. Um, and let's run it. Yeah, and we get a type error, um, which is JavaScript's way of saying you can't do that. <laughs> so it says assignment to constant variable. So it's, you know, so you can see it's protected. It will not let you change it. So now what I need to do is I need to comment this out so that we can you know, continue on and not have this error coming up all the time. So I'm just gonna comment it out, but I just wanna kind of show you, it really is true. If you use const, it can't be changed. Okay, um, let's look at uh, the next slide here. We're gonna talk about naming variables. So um, it matters uh, kind of how you choose your name. Uh, you wanna be descriptive. So it's very clear what something is. Um, readability is more important than length. Back in the day, uh, length was a very important consideration because of the way things were stored in you know, 8 bits. So, uh, you know, I remember using DOS as a kid where you literally could not have a file name that was longer than eight characters. 
Um, that's not important anymore. Readability is more important. Um, and you want to avoid confusion with other variables and make it really obvious not only what specific information it holds, but what data type it is. Um, so you can tell if something is supposed to represent a number or a string or whatever. Um, you don't want to use keywords like const as a variable name because the keywords are reserved in JavaScript as keywords. So you can't um, actually use those as variable names. Um, so, you know, icy flavor uh, is not super helpful. So call it ice cream flavor, just spell it out. It's totally cool. Um, scoops, uh, you know, that could refer to anything, right? Um, but it, in this case, what we really mean is number of scoops. So call it number of scoops or maybe num scoops would be, you know, a, co a common way to shorten it a little bit. Um, and then type, well, you know, what do we mean by type? That could refer to anything. So let's say cone type instead. We're talking about the type of ice cream cone. So this is kind of the thought behind this. You just wanna make sure that you are thinking it through. Um, so let's do a couple quick examples here. Um, these are not great choices for variable names. Uh, I mean, they're all right, but they're not great. So let book equal, and then we have, you know, The Princess Bride by S, you know, oh, S, S. Morgan Stern's classic tale of true love and high adventure, the good parts version. And then the author, uh, we have let name equal. Well, name, whose name, right? But that's the author. Uh, what type, adventure, kind, hardcover. But if you just look at the variables, you're like, I have no idea what type or kind means. Um, and books, plural, uh, apparently is a number. We really know that without you know, finding out the value, right? So let's actually have some better um, names for these. And I'm just gonna copy it. And then we're gonna change the names here. And I'm gonna say, you know, instead of just saying book, I'm going to say book title. Um, and instead of name, I'm going to say, you know, author or book author, if you wanna be, you know, really specific. Um, I could say that this, you know, adventure is like the genre, right? Um, and you know maybe uh, this is you know the format, uh, hardcover or paperback or whatever, um, or digital because we are in the 21st century. Uh, and this one I might want to say this actually specifically is supposed to remember the number of copies of this book that are available. Like maybe this is for a library, right? Um, so I'll call this num copies available. So as you can see, having specific names is much better. Because when you're just looking at your code and you don't necessarily know the values behind the code, um, you know you need to know what you're working with and what you're talking about. So just kind of keep uh, keep that in mind as you're creating variable names. Just keep them meaningful, keep them clear, um, and uh, everything will go better for you. It'll be your TAs will will love you because they'll be able to read your code and understand what it is you're trying to do. Um, yeah. Okay. So we are going to take um, a short break, but before we do, I wanna take questions. Who has questions? Yeah, I have a question. Is that yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. um, in the documentation for JavaScript, it mentions use const as much as possible and let when, when you have to. Is that the same rule we're gonna follow here? Or, or? Um, yeah, that, that rule really applies more when you are working with more complex data types than just a string or a number. Um, it, that's more for like when you're working with arrays and uh, functions and, you know, importing. Well, I'm actually going to show you an example of it at the end of the lecture when we talk about um, using uh, user input, getting user input in the console. That's Thank you. Question. Yeah. Uh, Melanie? Uh, hi. So I just wanted to make something clear. So when we're talking about the difference between declare and initial, mm -hmm. declare is kind of like, we're saying the string and initial is sort of like the number, like that's how. Uh, no, actually um, the difference is that declaring is when you uh, use the keyword let and give the variable a name, but you don't assign a value to it yet. And the value can be a string, the value can be a number, but that part, when you assign the value, that's initializing the variable. Okay, so I guess I'm just trying to understand like, value as in value can be a number value can be yep but value is, is just data it just means some piece of information and it can be a string it can be a number you're going to learn about more more data types as we go along mm -hmm. okay i think i got you now yeah yeah so yeah so here we've done this all in one line right we declare it let visini phrase and then we initialize by saying you know give it the value and inconceivable 
And then that, that one was a string. This one's a number. Yeah. Okay, uh, Zachary? Hello. Um, I had a question regarding the escape characters. This, uh, obviously, they're going to be more than, than N and T, right? But yeah. um, these are the ones you'll use the most. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I find these very, very helpful when I'm trying to, you know, you know, run my code. I also, I also like to uh, do the analogy of um, declaring is like you're writing. Let's say you're moving. Declaring is writing in your, the box, giving the box a name, and then the thing after that, the value is going to be the stuff that you're putting inside. Yeah, that's so maybe a good that's analogy. a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a Ray. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's Annie. Um, I have a question. Um, if you give a variable a value and you use an assignment operator, does there need to be spaces in between? Um, that, that's the accepted way to format it. It would still okay. work without it, but I, I'm pretty particular about making sure that my code is clean to begin with when I type. So if you see me do something it's probably going to be the generally accepted clean way to do it. When you guys, like when I when I got uh, into my actual like develop jobs as a developer after I finished launch code, I found out about this wonderful thing called linting, which is where they have programs that will actually go through your code and clean it up for you. And if, if you've accidentally, you know, if I accidentally had left us, you know, something like this, when I lint it, it would fix it for me. So what my suggestion to you is you guys just get in the habit of doing it right the first time and then you, you probably won't have a whole lot of linting issues you have to sort out yeah uh courtney um okay so the difference between declaring and initializing so i understand that with declaring you don't have to assign a value um right but in what instance would you do that so it's so like so let uh, Vizini, uh, Vizini phrase and then semicolon, that's technically declaring, but it doesn't declare for anything. So why would you? Uh, uh, do yeah, th there's uh, absolutely th there's well, on Thursday, we're going to talk about conditionals where you actually can have multiple outcomes um, with saying if this is true, then do you know, put this do this code. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, do this code. Um, sometimes you might want to create a variable, but you don't know what the value is going to be yet until you run through some logic. And so you might declare it. Um, and, and when we get into like loops next week and things like that, it, it'll start to become more and more obvious how there are going to be times when it makes sense to declare, but not initialize. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Riley? Um, so for not a number, if you did type of, it would it would give you a number, correct? Um, yes, that's, yeah, that's what happened here. Yep. Okay, so even though it would not be able to be used in calculations, it right. could cause errors, like if you do a type check partway through your program. Yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure to point that out just so you understand that just because it says that it's of the number type, it doesn't mean that it's actually something you can calculate with. It's just that not a number is a special kind of value. Um, that exists in the number class, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, I uh, Mario, I will take your question and then we're gonna have a break. Okay, so not a number, right? Is it like, if, when it pops up, do we have to, is there something like a problem that we would have to fix or is it just to let us know that it's not a number? It depends on the circumstance. Um, generally speaking, uh, you want to, like if you're writing your code to where, um, you know, somebody puts in some information in your website, uh, like fills out a form, for example, and you pull that information in, um, you know, and then you have to run it through some code and like you haven't set up your things properly to where it can use it as a number if it was intended to be used as a number, then your code is going to break and something could happen that the user doesn't expect. And so there's going to be times when you're going to want to, you know, very uh, explicitly convert um, or, or, you know, check, check for types and check for these kinds of things to prevent your code breaking. Yeah. And you, you, Thank you. you will do some examples of this over the next few classes. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to have to stop taking questions because we're going to have to move on. We still have more to talk about after the break, um, but feel free to put your questions in the lecture questions channel um, because TAs are watching out for that. 
but we will take a five minute break. It's not very long, but it's all we can afford. Um, and I'm going to put a timer on here and try to be back before the timer finishes, because as soon as it does, I'm going to start talking and we're going to continue on. Okay. All right. I will see you guys in five minutes. Nice. So lots of people haven't watched Princess Bride. What's up with that? <laughs> you have a childhood. That's what's up with that. Yeah, I think I saw it as, as a child, but like a child, child. Wow. Uh, I would highly recommend the book for people who it's like. Very it's very good. It's 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 very good. The book it's is reading. fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> even if you've seen the movie. Mm -hmm. They're very different, but they're amazing. I try to check the type of um, a number divided by zero, like 10, by, 10 divided by zero. But it should give me none, but it gave me a number type. Yeah, Sneha? Yes. Yeah, not a number. NAN is in JavaScript part of the number class. So if you have something that is not a number and you do a type of operation on it, it's still going to return NAN, which in of itself is a number in JavaScript. So that's why it still shows okay. number. Oh, makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm again, a big fan of analogies, but the way I see it is like you're, you have the category of number and string, those different categories. And if you label it, you know, if you change it to a number, it's going to go into the number category, but like in a little box, like the NA, NAN box, that's just kind of just living there. We can't really do anything with it, you know? I don't know if that makes sense, but.
Okay, and we're back. Welcome back. Um, okay, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is evaluating expressions. Um, and this is, you know, really where we're getting into why, you know, variables are so helpful. Um, but uh, an expression is just um, some sort of, uh, you know, collection of things that is going to let you use code to solve a problem. And it can combine, you know, different valuables, variables, use different operators. Uh, it can even be as simple as just getting the value of a single variable, um, which, you know, we were console logging a variable name earlier, right? And so it was evaluating it and giving, giving us that value. Um, it can also be complex with multiple operations. Um, but, but when we say that we are, you know, evaluating an expression, um, we get this resulting value and we say that that's returned. Um, I highlighted these because this is a lot of vocabulary. We're throwing a lot of vocabulary at you guys um, as we're talking about all these things. And so I just wanted to kind of point these out because I, you're going to hear me say them a lot. And I want to make sure you understand what I mean when I say it. So yeah, so we'll have an expression. We'll let JavaScript evaluate it and give us a result. And right now we're seeing that result by console logging it. So we can see it in the console. Um, and that's being returned after the, the expression is evaluated. Um, so this idea of hard coding, um, you know, if you have some sort of raw value that you're using instead of a variable, we just call that hard coding. So when, when I say hard coding, that's what I mean. Um, and you can make your code more flexible by using a variable so that you can assign other values to it. Um, so here's an example. I have a name and I give it, you know, I store John in it, but then I console log hi Mike and I get hi Mike. But if I were to console log hi and then name, and we'll talk about this concatenation thing here in a second about how to put these together. Um, then I actually don't see hi Mike, I see hi John because I used the variable. Um, and then later in the code, I can come back and say, hey, I wanna change name now to be Anita. And so now when I console log hi name, I mean, it's the exact same line of code, but because I've reassigned it, now we see hi Anita. Okay. Um, and in order to use an expression, you want to make sure uh, that um, you are either just using it in place or you can store it in a variable and then use it after the fact. Um, and storing it in a variable is generally a good idea if you are pretty sure you're gonna use it more than once. Um, otherwise, it really doesn't matter if you do it in place. Um, but here's an example. So I console log six times eight, it comes out as 48. Um, there's no variable involved. It's just hard coded six times eight. Um, but what if I use a variable because I think I'm gonna use it more than once. So I say, let product equal five times six. And then I say, let sum equal 10 plus product. So I'm using this now. Um, now I can go and I can console log product and get the original value up here of 30, right? Um, and then I can console log the sum that used that value and I have 10 plus 30 is now 40, okay? Um, okay, so let's see, do I wanna talk about operators before? Yeah, let's talk about operators. And then I'm gonna actually do some coding examples for you guys. Um, but expressions are only really useful if you understand how to put all the different pieces of data together. So you have your uh, basic arithmetic operators like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Those are pretty easy to understand. Exponentiation, um, in JavaScript, this is done with a double asterisk, and that means to the power of. So you might have you know, double asterisk two, and that's squared, or double asterisk three, that's cubed, and so on, okay? Uh, there's also increment and decrement, which means to um, increase by one or to decrease by one. I'll do examples of these in a second. Um, there's a modulo operator um, that uh, is a percent sign. Um, it's, when we talk about it kind of quickly, we sometimes call it mod, um, that operator. Um, and the modulus is actually the number you're dividing by, um, but the the concept here is that it produces the remainder after you divide. So it's not, it's not division. It's just the remainder if something, you know, is, so if you had something that was even 
and you divided it, there is no remainder. So the, so the um, you know, result would just be a zero. Um, so here's uh, you know, practical application. Uh, oh, hold on, I may have these in a different order. Yeah, okay, so let's talk over here about you know, an example of this and then I'll talk about the practical application. Okay, so 44 mod eight, that's how you say that. Um, if we do that, we actually uh, can see here an example where I've got um, this modulus eight, um, that's what I'm dividing by to get the remainder. And I have, you know, these groups of eight, perfect groups of eight, and I have five of them because eight times five is 40, right? And then there's four left over. So that's the modulo, uh, mod modulo um, the remainder that comes out. So uh, eight is, uh, the percent sign is the modulo, that's the operator itself, eight is the modulus, and we have these perfect groups of eight and four left over. And therefore, 44 mod eight is four. Um, so the practical application, uh, a very common one that you will probably be using pretty shortly in some of your exercises or studios is uh, determining if something is even or odd. So if I take some number and I say some num, you know, mod two, and that turns out as zero, then we know some num must be even because there was no remainder. But if I say some num mod two um, and I get a one, um, then I know that it has to be odd because there was a remainder of one. Okay, so that's how the mod, uh, mod modulo operator works. Um, and we'll do an example of that too in a second. So order of operations, and some of you are now being, you know, transported back in time to, you know, junior high or middle school, or maybe even earlier, depending on when you learned this. But most of us learned PEMDAS, right? <laughs> and so you have parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division, and then addition and subtraction. And this is the order in which you, um, you know, separate things out in order to determine how you uh, are going to calculate them when you have a very complex expression. So we can look at this example here uh, with, you know, all this uh, math that has to be done and you're like, okay, where do I start? Um, so the first thing would be to say, okay, parentheses are first. So clearly we need to evaluate this part and this part um, and you know, get the stuff that's inside the parentheses um, evaluated uh, before we start engaging with some of the other elements of it. Um, and the reason we're talking about this uh, way past you know, middle school is because uh, this is how the computer does it. And so you need to understand how JavaScript is going to interpret your code, okay? Um, so I do this and I say, okay, the next thing is exponents. So within this one and within this one, I know that that two squared is next two cubed is next. And so then I can uh, break that down. And now I just have two plus four and two times seven minus eight. Well, this is you know down to addition and there's nothing else there. So we could do that. This one still has a little more going on. And this is where multiplication and division um, take priority over subtraction. So we're not gonna do seven minus eight and multiply it times two. We're gonna do two times seven and then take 14 and um, subtract eight. And so once we've done that, we're down to just eight times six minus 36 divided by six and no more parentheses. And uh, there again, multiplication and division take precedence over the um, subtraction sign. And so now um, we have the uh, answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, which is of course 42, if you're a Douglas Adams fan. Okay, uh, so uh, let's see. Do I have anything else? Oh, yes. Um, so even if you're working with strings and not numbers, um, things like parentheses matter. Um, and so, you know, as we kind of unfold some of these things over the next couple of classes, uh, you'll kind of see uh, different times when parentheses are a really good idea. And I'll kind of point that out to you. But this is how it works. Okay. Um, when you are building strings um, by, uh, you know, taking more than one and kind of trying to Make, make them all push together, um, use a plus sign. But when you're working with strings, then JavaScript knows uh, that you're actually working with a string and, and not numbers. Um, and this is called concatenation. So when I say we're concatenating a string, this is what I'm talking about. Um, if you have both strings and numbers in the expression, uh, JavaScript will do this from left to right. And so as soon as it counters a string, from then on, it starts uh, treating everything like a string, even if it's a number. So in this first example, we just have strings. We have Y, E, and S. So if I concatenate those together, what am I gonna get? 
Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, a single string that says yes, right. What if I do one plus two plus three as a string plus four? One, two, three, four. Anyone, Anyone else? else? Will be three. 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 Yeah, everybody mute. Uh, we just had like a, a wormhole or something. Okay, so uh, yes, it's very strange, but this is what happens. One plus two is three, no problem. Then JavaScript says, oh, you have a string. So then it starts treating things like string and it concatenates them as three plus three plus four. Um, and it, it treated this as a number because at that point it come across a string. So now it's gonna treat everything like strings. So uh, if you end up with some really weird behavior when you're working with both strings and numbers and plus signs, that is why, okay, just so you know. Um, all right, uh, I think this might be the last operator one. Uh, compound assignments, um, we have uh, a way to kind of have some shorthand from when you're assigning a new value to an existing variable. Um, and you actually just wanna update it. So we can say plus equals uh, to add an update a value. And so essentially the way that works out is if I was to have X plus equals four, that's the same thing as saying x equals x plus four. I wanna take the value, whatever x was, I wanna take it and I wanna add it to four. And then I wanna take that value and reassign it to x. So it's just a, a very quick shorthand. And this is pretty much the way you're gonna see the people do it. You're not really ever gonna see people do it the long way like this. Uh, so same thing for subtraction, multiplication, and division. It all works the same way. Um, most of the time you're probably gonna see the addition and subtraction being used. Um, but uh, that's, that's how that works. Okay, so let's go back to the code and do some examples of this. And normally I'm gonna stop right now because it's almost eight o'clock. I'm gonna say, I mean, I'm not gonna stop lecturing. I'm going to stop for a second to mention, I gotta be clear, that um, normally lecture is gonna be the first hour and a half of class. And then you will spend the last half of class in studio. And if you have a coding studio, which is most of the time, I will have a video, pre-recorded video for you to go over the studio that you will watch on your own time later, okay? Tonight, there is no coding studio and it was the first night of class and we have a lot to talk about. So I'm gonna go a little bit over, but you'll, you'll go to your studios as soon as we're done with the rest of this. Okay, um, so let's uh, look at this code. Yes, here we are. Okay, so we are um, evaluating um, some things. So I can print the difference between A and B using this, you know, arithmetic operator for subtraction. So I just do console.log and say A minus B, or actually, I mean, technically that's better, okay. And we get five, um, seven minus two is five. Um, and then uh, in this one, we have uh, M, we wanna do M to the fourth power using this variable M that is equal to seven. So we wanna use the exponentiation operator um, but it says, in this case, create a variable to store the result and then print the variable name. So we'll do that. We'll say m to the fourth power and uh, make it m. And I'm going to do that double asterisk. That is the uh, exponentiation operator and just say four. And then we'll log it to the console. If I can type it. There we go. And um, we'll run that. And we see 2,401, which is apparently uh, m to the fourth power, uh, seven to the fourth power. Okay, um, incrementing and decrementing. So let's say you have this value um, five and you just wanna increment it by one. Uh, we can do it and um, we are going to first print it and do it at the same time, which produces some interesting behavior. Then we'll kind of just check the value. And then we're going to print it using the operator in front of the variable name, and we'll see that it actually performs differently. So if you ever are, are using, oh, sorry, this should say um, plus plus x. Um, if you ever are working with this operator and things don't come out quite how you expect if you're doing it in place, um, this will explain it. So let's say we want to console log and as we're printing it, we're going to use the operator and say, let's increase X by one. What do you guys think is gonna come out? Five. Six. 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 
works. Yeah, yeah. So this is an interesting question, right? So now let's just go check the check the value just to see what's currently stored after we do that. Um, it actually produces five if you do it this way because by putting the, the um, operator after the variable, it says okay, print six and then update it. Um, so it printed, I'm sorry, print X and then update it. So it prints five, it updates it. And now when we print X again, we see it's six. So then if I um, actually do it the other way and say, I want to do it while I'm printing it, but I put the operator first, this time we're going to see that it produces seven because it actually did the operation before it uh, evaluated it and printed it. Okay. So you can do it either way. Um, but, uh, if you do it that way, uh, most of the time, honestly, the way you're going to use it is by just doing it without like, you know, printing it at the same time or whatever. So if I just go and do it, and now I check the value by printing it, now I should see eight. Yeah, there you go. Okay, and decrementing works the exact same way. So I can, I can set this up. I've got, you know, y equals 19. Um, I can say, you know, console log y minus minus. Um, and I should uh, still see 19, and we do. But I can check the value and verify that it did get um, decremented um, in that process, and it's now 18. And then I go and I say, okay, let's um, print it and decrement at the same time, but let's do it in the opposite order so that it actually produces the final value. And we see 17. And then if I come down and um, you know just do it, y minus minus, and say, okay, JavaScript, go do it. I don't need to see it, but go do it. And then I check it. Okay, we should have uh, 16, yes, and we do. Okay, here's the modulo operator. Um, it says print the remainder from 100 with a modulus of seven. Um, and, you know, just so we know what we expect, seven times 14 is 98. So we're going to expect this to be two if we do it right. Um, so I will say console.log and I'm going to say 100 mod. Uh, what did I say to do? Oh, yeah, seven, right. <laughs> and um, we will check it and see if it comes out as two. And it does. We have a two. And then we can do the same thing um, by printing uh, the remainder of six with a modulus of two. So we'll do six mod two. And this one we expect to be zero because that's an even divide, right? So there is no remainder. Okay. So uh, this was just uh, to prove that my example on order of operations was correct, that we do get 42. And so you can actually run the code here and see that it does evaluate it the way that it shows you and it is 42. Um, string building. So we have let title after mailage equal princess. And then the, her original name, of course, was buttercup. So we want to practice how do we concatenate these two things together? Now, I'm going to do this not quite correctly first, just so you kind of see um, what you have to think about as you're doing this. I can do title after mail wedge, I'll say it you know, properly according to the movie. And um, I uh, just concatenate together with that. But you know, what's gonna happen? What do you guys think is gonna happen? They're gonna um, be one more. Who knows together. space? Yeah, there's not, gonna be, there's not gonna be a space. We're going to see Princess Buttercup, all one word. So to fix that, we literally just add in a space and make sure there's a space between the two. Um, you are going to learn uh, next, no, in a few classes, you're going to learn better ways to um, work with strings and variables together. But for now, this is what you know. And so just pay attention to these kinds of things. Um, so now we run it again and we see, you know, princess space buttercup like we want. So just think about that because you're going to be printing things to the console and, and, it's, and it needs to come out a certain way. And um, you just want to pay attention to that kind of thing. Okay, um, and then the uh, whole idea of doing uh, strings and numbers, um, we can uh, do this also. And I'm gonna say let number of ships equal four. And then I've lost my equals four, there we go. Um, and uh, I can um, put this all together and I'm actually, for the sake of time, going to just copy this over instead of typing it out. But I'll talk about it. Um, console log, and then I have this whole string, you write plus number of ships plus space copies of a letter. I'll send my space 
number of ships plus space, fastest ships, one in each direction. Okay, so I, that's a lot of work. And again, you will learn better ways to do this, but um, this works. We can take all of these little bits and pieces. And when we run it, we have a complete sentence and we used number of ships twice um, with the same value. And it comes out exactly the way we want. You write four copies of a letter. I'll send my four fastest ships, one in each direction. Okay, so that's an example, of, you know, kind of a more complex way that you can integrate. And it, of course, this entire thing now is a string because um, it didn't matter if these were numbers, it automatically converted it as part of the string. Okay, compound assignment, number of boos is three. So after Buttercup asks the ancient woman why she's booing her, she's booed five more times. So we need to update this variable. So let's um, say, you know, number of boos um, and we're going, to, oops, lost my spot. There we go. And we're gonna use this compound assignment operator plus equals to say, we wanna take the original value of booze and we wanna add five to it. And so now when I console log um, <laughs> number of booze, I should get eight. And we do, we get eight. So that's how you use that to quickly update something and, and just you know, reassign that new value to the same variable name. All right, we are onto our very last topic um, for the lecture portion, um, getting user input, um, which is very important and you'll be using it a lot um, for your graded assignment and for uh, graded assignment two as well. So this idea is that you're interacting with a user in the console. The very first thing you have to do is import this library called ReLineSync that's built into the JavaScript, but you can't automatically use it. You have to actually have a way to say, hey, I wanna use this. Um, and you just do that once, typically at the very top of the file. You're gonna see a lot of my examples where I just do it in the example, not at the top of the file because I have so many other examples, but that's okay. Um, you assign it to a constant. So you guys had questions earlier about this idea of, you know, when do you use const versus let? This is a great example of where you want to default to using const. Because essentially what you want to say is, I want to have uh, this, this um, variable, but I want it to not be able to be overwritten. Um, we'll call it input. Um, and you can name it anything you want, but I am going to consistently use input. Your curriculum often uses input just to make it clear that's what we're doing. Um, but it, it basically creates an object that represents the library so that you can access the functionality that, that is all this code they've written that's already ready to go so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, the thing that you're going to use the most right now is um, dot question. So this is input dot question and question is actually a function, but when we use it like this with an object, we call it a method. So when I talk about the question method, this is what I mean, okay? Um, Input.question, and it does two different things. It prints the string between the parentheses to the console. So you see it in the console, but then it also returns whatever response the user en enters at the prompt after that. And then typically what you're gonna wanna do is actually set it up so that you're storing that in a variable so that you can use it later. Every once in a while, it might be convenient to do it just in place but typically you're gonna to wanna to assign it to a variable. So here's the um, syntax for that. We, uh, this is the line that would normally go at the very top of your file. You just say const, call it a name, I'll use input. This represents the library that you are requiring. Um, and I wanna stop for just a second and say, if anyone has ever worked with more advanced JavaScript before, you know that this is not the only way to do this. There's actually an import keyword, but in, in Replit, all of the, the most basic um, REPLs that it creates for you with JavaScript with Node doesn't use that advanced syntax. So you need to do it this way in order for it to work in REPLit, okay? Um, and later on, you can you know, use the, the newer syntax uh, to your heart's content with other compilers. Okay, so um, you create it, you import the library that you need. In this case, it's read line sync. And then you establish a variable, um, give it a name, and this is what's gonna store that response when it comes back. And then you ask the question, you say, um, you know, enter your name. So it's gonna put enter your name in the console, your user, which when you are in development is you, because you have to test your own code, right? Um, you're going to type in, you know, your name, and then um, you, uh, that will print the question and then also return the user response to be stored in that variable. Okay. Um, 
we're going to do uh, an example of this, and then I will open up things for questions. Okay, so um, the very first thing we want to do is import. We'll do it right here just to kind of keep it with this example. But this is where I say const input. And I we use const again because we don't ever want input to actually be used as again and represent anything else because it's very important that it always consistently be able to be used as, as representing this library. Um, I do require and say read line sync. There we go. And now this is available to me and I don't ever need to declare it again. Um, even if I use it multiple times, I only have to import it once. So we, we've done that. So now I'm just gonna like, you know, print some sort of greeting. I'm just gonna use regular old console log first, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of context on an example of how this would work. Um, I'm gonna say console log and uh, I'll put a little new line in there. Welcome to the Princess Bride fan club. And I saw your comments in lecture chat, by the way, and I guess it's because I'm old that this this is like, you know, um, I, I, I because I'm so familiar with it. So yes, if you've never seen this movie, you really should go watch it. It's fantastic. Okay, um, let's uh, print that out. So we we start out with "Welcome to the Princess Bride Fan Club." That's great. Now we want to ask the user something. So this is where we uh, are going to use our input variable and attach the question method in order to um, uh, actually have it not only print it, but receive a response. So I'm gonna store that in a variable. I'm gonna call it um, favorite character. So that's very clear what it is I'm asking them and you know, what their, their response represents. And then I'll say input that question and just say, who is your favorite, favorite character? And I'll, uh, I'm actually doing, I'm doing my formatting a little too soon. Let's, let's wait. Okay. Um, and then um, that's it. So if I run this now, we can see that it prints welcome to the Princess Bride Fan Club. And then it says, who is your favorite character? And then you can see right here that there is um, a prompt, right? You can click on it, it becomes solid. Um, so that's where you can type your an uh, answer in and um, I can, uh, say without reservation, my favorite character is Miracle Max because Billy Crystal is hilarious. And uh, so I can enter that and then it's now stored in this thing. Of course, we have we can't prove it yet because we haven't um, you know done anything with it. So let's uh, print a response to the user. But um, yes, let's let's keep going and then I'll I'll clean it up later. Okay, so we'll print a response and just say console. Log. And this is where we're going to use the skills you just learned about, um, nope, um, about how to concatenate uh, things together with variables and strings. So I'll say, you know, favorite character, <laughs> which whatever it is, that's my favorite character too. Okay. Um, so let's see this in practice. All right. Who's my favorite character? I say Miracle Max. And it says Miracle Max, that's my favorite character too. So it substituted whatever the valuable the value was that it captured from the user. And now you're able to use it however you want. And in this case, I spit, you know, spit out this um, response that you know showed them that I, I used what they gave me. Um, so then we can ask them for something else. So we, we're gonna use input again. And we'll say let six fingered man equal input dot question. And we'll say, you know, pop quiz. Who, who is the six-fingered man? Anybody want to tell me who the six-fingered man is? Count Rugen. Count Rugen, yes. So um, we will ask this question and then we'll uh, go ahead and code this part too. We'll print a response. Um, and in this case, um, you know, I might just do something like, uh, that's correct. And then say, you know, um, plus, I need to put a space in there though, don't I? Okay. Six fingered man, space was the man Amigo was looking for to avenge his father's death. Spoilers, guys, if you haven't seen this yet, spoilers. Okay. Um, all right, so let's run it. We'll do the whole thing. So we'll say Miracle Max. And then it says, who is the six-fingered man? And I can say, Count Rugen, 
and it'll say that's correct count Rugen was the man Inigo was looking for okay so um the first thing I want to do is go back and clean this up a little bit using some of those special characters so it doesn't all run together like this and I also want to clean it up when I when I use input that question I want to think about that prompt being you know this is kind of messy right this being right up against that um question mark so there's a couple ways I could approach that I could either add just add in a space right there so that it at least pushes the prompt away from the question mark but I could also push it to the next line. So maybe that's what I want to do. And I want to actually even indent it to make it even you know, more clear that it's it's a response and not just something that's being printed. Um, so, and, and that's just personal choice. So I, I'm just showing you one way to do it. Um, so I can do that. Um, and then I can kind of uh, come back here to the next one and say, I want this to be separated with another blank line. So I'm going to add. Um, I'm going to add a string here at the front because remember these escape characters have to be part of a string. I can't just do the slash n. I have to put it in quotes. And then I just make sure that this entire thing is going to be down another line. Um, and then here I can put one here and separate out this a little bit. Um, same thing here. I can push this down and tab it over with a T. And um, then the next one, you know, maybe I just make sure that this is on, you know, separated by a line. So let's print it again. One more time. Yeah, so now you can see the prompt is down a line and it's tabbed over and I'll say Miracle Max. And then I, I you know, have this nice and spaced out, and easy to read. And now it asks me for the 16 year man and I say Count Rugen and um, it says that's correct. So it's a lot more readable. Um, so definitely take advantage of these escape characters to make sure that as you're interacting with the user, things are easy to read and understand. Um, so you may have noticed that there's a flaw with this approach, and that's that maybe the user didn't put in Count Rugen, and now we've told them that's correct. And they, you know, they've said print our or something, right? Um, so this is a problem that can't be solved in chapter four. It's solved in chapter five when you learn about conditionals um, in order to be able to add logic to your code so that you can produce a different output to the council the console depending on whether you know a value was this or that so my challenge to you is uh, after you've done your prep work for class two um, you could come back to this and practice with this um, you'll have links to the code in the, in the slides um, which i'll make the slides available um, at the end of the class um, or at the end of the lecture rather uh, and you could actually try to set up a conditional to produce a different response if they did not answer count, count Rugen, and you could say that's incorrect or something like that, right? Um, and in the solution version of this code, um, I, I actually do show the solution for how to do that. But see if you can figure it out yourself, because you're you guys are going to learn the best when you're like you know um, practicing it um, and problem solving it yourself. Oop, and I don't want to show you show you. Oh, that's a yeah. Okay, different screen. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. So who has questions about the things I just uh, talked about? All right, uh, Zachary. Sorry, I think my hand has been up the whole. Oh, since, okay. Since All right, break. no problem. Uh, right, you're good. Anne or Annie. Same thing. Was your, was your hand just still up? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't press anything. I don't know what happened. Okay, I'll, I'll lower it. Okay. Uh, Jesus? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, so when using input, uh, does it only take strings or like, uh, is it, and is it like, uh, or can I take numbers? And if I guess, would it be like a type of, would it be a string or a number if you even put a number, you know what yeah, I mean? That that's an excellent question. And um, that's something else you'll work with a little bit in the next class, uh, because um, when you are learning to kind of evaluate something that's been given to you, yeah. So here's the answer. JavaScript, when input.question returns something to you, it's always a string. Hmm. If you go and you try to use it as a number and try to calculate with it or something like that, um, it will try to convert it to a number. And if it can, it will. But typically, best practice is to um, explicitly convert it to a number, you know, using that number uh, function that we have way up here somewhere. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So you could actually receive receive your input from the user and actually put your input dot question in here so that it converts it off the bat as soon as it gets it. And that's another one of those things where it's like making sure your code is 
you know, error proof. These are the kinds of things you want to think about. But you'll have you'll have uh, ch chances to practice that as you get into more complex stuff that you're going to be doing over the next few classes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ariel. Okay, so during the launch, uh, the discovery class that we did, um, mm -hmm. we were talking in terms of Python syntax, right? Which would be the same as the input dot question, except you just put input. And you could put the, is that like, that's the, that's the equivalent here, right? You said something about Python? When, with the discovery class that we did before today? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll say it for another time. No, that's totally cool. Yeah, no, everything that you're learning in this unit is going to be JavaScript based. Okay. So, so you can just count on, if I teach you syntax on something in this unit, it's going to be JavaScript. If it's next unit, it's going to be Java. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, see, is it Angel or Angel? Uh, I just go by Angel. Um, <laughs> so I just have a quick question about required. Is that like one of those keywords that you were talking about before that we shouldn't be using it outside of this instance? Um, it's that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I would. It, it's actually um, like you can actually look at this and it tells you um, that it's. Uh, a, it's a function. You can you don't know the syntax yet, but this is a function. So it's part of this node require class. So it's actually you know taking in this value into the function so it can process it. Um, so actually, uh, it's not a keyword, but um, okay. that would probably be a weird uh, variable name. So I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> okay, uh, Andrew. Uh, hey, uh, my question is actually extremely related to that. Uh, so is read line sync, is that, that's a string? Yep. Uh, like, I guess what, like, I don't know, that confuses me. Like, how, how is that a string or why yeah. is that a string? It's just the name of the library. So um, it basically means that this function is set up to, uh, to where it'll take in that name as a string and then go find the library that um, is, has that name. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mario, you still have a question? Uh, yeah. So when you did um, Y minus minus, I didn't see you use uh, console.log, and I was trying to figure out why. Well, this is probably the way you'll do it most of the time. Uh, you would not be logging it as you use it. You would just go and do it. And it's just a command. It just says, take Y and decrement it. And so then I said, okay, I'm going to go and check the value now that I've done that. And I checked the value in the console and it had in fact, you know, um, decremented it. This was only just to, sh to uh, give you a way to see what was happening behind the scenes so that you understand the difference between putting the operator after the variable versus putting it before. But yeah, any, most of the time when I'm console logging here, it, it's just to show you the output, the, you know, the final result of something. Um, I am. Okay. Yeah, I see that several. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're cool. Um, I, that's a good clarification. Um, because you guys are new at all of this, and I don't want to take for granted. Uh, you know that there's things you understand if you don't about you know some of the things I'm doing here. It's totally cool. Um, no, I for sure. But the semicolon as well. So, will it still requires a semicolon though. Any any line of code that's to be executed should have a semicolon after it. Yeah. Um, we're, okay. When you learn about conditionals and loops and things where you're actually creating structures like, um, and you're enclosing blocks of code, there's going to be exceptions where that doesn't require um, a semicolon, but everything you're doing uh, tonight, yeah, you want a semicolon. Um, I see that you guys have tons of questions, but we have to move on because I need to get you guys to studio and I still have a, um, one more thing to talk about. So um, ask your questions in the lecture questions channel and either the TAs or I will get back to you. Um, yes, okay. So I uh, just want to quick, quickly mention that website again. I have four practice exercises uh, that are, covers the content from tonight um, that you will find here and you can you know narrow it down if you want. Um, and the link is here and it's also in Slack. Okay, so let me talk really quickly about um, assignment one, because unlike your other graded assignments, we break this out into multiple parts for you so that you can kind of just attack it a little bit at a time. And part one, um, you are 
you almost know everything you need to do to do uh, part one already just tonight. But this part is due on the 22nd of May. Um, you just want to, uh, you're going to be basically conducting a quiz for somebody who's applying to the space program. So you're going to get this candidate's name. You're just going to ask them one question and then uh, get their response. And then you just tell them if their response was the correct answer or not. So that requires a conditional. So that's, you'll, you'll need to, you know, have the information from Thursday's class. And one, uh, by Thursday, you're going to be, uh, already go equipped to go do part one. So you'll be in good shape. Um, part two uh, is, yeah, I just mentioned this. Okay. Part two is where you're actually going to go back and take this quiz and uh, ask five different questions. And you're going to do it with the same block of code and we will teach you how. Um, so you'll be using conditionals, arrays, and loops. And then part three, you're going to add some calculations to grade the quiz, print a report that comes out in the console formatted a certain way. All of these instructions are uh, in your uh, book, which I don't have uh, out right now, but I can pull it up. Um, so if you go to your curriculum, under the chapters are quick links to the studios and under that are quick links to the assignments. So if you come here and you take a look, you can see they give you the requirements, they give you the starter code um, to go and fork from Replit. Um, and then um, just like you can and your uh, exercises and such. And then they take you through it, part one, part two, part three, and they show you what the report should look like at the end. Now I have a whole video that um, helps you understand the starter code a little bit because it's gonna look really, really complex and you're gonna see things we aren't teaching you yet. Um, but I show you in the video exactly like where, where you need to focus on, what things you can ignore for now, um, because a lot of this code in there is just for launch code to be able to have an auto grader to where it can run some tests and just check your code. And that helps your TAs be able to grade it more efficiently um, because there are lots of you and um, your TAs uh, have a lot to do. Okay, so uh, let's go back over here. Um, so just as a reminder, um, you can share, you can collaborate as much as you want to on your exercises and your studios, but your graded assignments, the only people you can show your code to is your TAs. So you can't, um, you know, discuss the specifics of solving it, and uh, you can discuss general concepts with each other, but you can't discuss the particulars of the assignment and your code or show the code from your classmates or from outside help. If you happen to be, uh, you know, good friends with another developer, um, you know, getting some help from them would actually violate the uh, academic integrity, you know, part of our code. Um, but uh, again, that final date, the 5th of, of uh, June is going to be a drop deadline. If you wanna stay enrolled in the course, your whole thing has to be graded, at, you know, correct, complete um, by 11.59 PM that night. Um, Launch Code has just learned that uh, we, we need to kind of just make sure that you're going to be able to succeed before you get in too deep. And so um, this is the only one that's that way. The other ones aren't going to be drop deadlines, but this first one is. But we split it into parts for you. So take it one step at a time. And you know, as you're learning these things with every new class, you're going to have the knowledge that you need to complete it. Um, all right, so you um, have class two coming up on Thursday. You'll be uh, looking at chapters five and six. And then for studio, you're actually gonna do the chapter four studio since you're doing the chapter five studio tonight, okay? And then next Monday, we will talk about strings and arrays. That's chapter seven and eight. And that's the same night that your part one of the assignment is due. All right, let's get you off to studio. Um, you're gonna talk about smart goals and having a growth mindset. Um, you know, get, take some time to get to know each other and your, and your TAs. Uh, talk about what your goals are for your class. Um, talk about what your goals are for your career. And just think about what is motivating and inspiring you to, uh, you know, dig in and do all this very, very hard work to make this happen. Um, and there will, again, be no studio review since this is a non-studio, uh, coding studio. Uh, and that is, I believe, that. Um, let me double check. Um, yep, that's the last slide. All right, so um, what you need to do from here is, uh, basically close, you know, exit this Zoom meeting and then go over to your uh, group um, mess, you know, your, your group channel for your TA group and get the link to your uh, studio. And you'll just be meeting with your own TA group for that, for the remainder of the class time tonight. You guys, we've got about an hour to do this exercise. 
and get to know each other. And um, then, you know, work on that prep work for uh, Thursday. And I will see you on Thursday for conditionals. Yep. And real quickly, Carrie, if I, if I may. So you'll get into, you'll leave this Zoom. You'll go into your TA Zoom. They'll distribute the attendance code. And then um, once you're done with the studio, you're dismissed for the evening. Nothing more needs to be done. And we'll see you on the Thursday. Yeah, that's great. So I will post um, the link, uh, or I will post uh, in the announcements channel and let you know when um, the video from this um, lecture is up on YouTube. I'll be processing it in the next you know, hour or so. And then um, I, I'm going to right away, go ahead and post the slides for you so you can see everything. Okay, um, so go ahead, uh, go to studio and um, have a great uh, time getting to know each other.